Hello everyone, and thanks for watching this presentation. Today, I'm going to talk about some of my recent research. My research program examines conflicts that originate at the grassroots and that concern ways that natural resources, including mineral resources, biodiversity, open space, etc., should be governed. So my main research questions are, under what conditions do grassroots environmental struggles arise or not? What internal and external factors shape these processes and what informs their outcomes? In examining these questions, I have focused on the role of socio-cultural and politico-economic factors, as well as strategies, especially alliances with other groups. Today I'll discuss some of my recent and ongoing work on conflicts over the environmental impacts of mining in New Caledonia in the South Pacific, and struggles over urban wetland governance in New Jersey. I'm also in the process of starting a new research project on grassroots resistance to mining in the Bad River watershed in northern Wisconsin, as I'll discuss very briefly at the end. I'll start off by whisking you away to the South Pacific. New Caledonia, is a Melanesian archipelago with a population of about 250,000, comprised of several ethnic groups. Melanesians, known as Kanak, make up 40% of the population. People of European ancestry make up about 30%, and the rest of the population is comprised of Asians, Polynesians, and other ethnicities. The main island, called Grande Terre, that's French for Big Island, Big land, sorry, is estimated to possess nearly 25% of the world's nickel reserves, and mining has taken place there since 1874. Meanwhile, the archipelago has been administered by metropolitan France since 1853. During the colonial era, Kanak saw their land taken away from them, often forcing them onto the lands of their long-standing enemies. In the pre-colonial era, authority main, lay, lay mainly with customary landowners, or more accurately, the clans that had arrived first in an area. However, the colonial era radically restructured customary authority systems. There are currently several officially recognized positions of customary authority, including lesser chief, high chief, member of the council of elders, customary senator, and member of the customary council of one of New Caledonia's eight customary regions. All these positions are occupied exclusively by men, usually senior. Although it hasn't gotten much attention in the Anglophone literature, New Caledonia is a very important place in its own right, as well as in terms of the broader issues it exemplifies. First, New Caledonia is considered a hotspot for biodiversity, with exceptionally high numbers of endemic species. It has especially high rates of endemism among its plant species. Some have a green sap from all the nickel in the soil, as you can see in the upper left-hand corner there, as well as reptiles and avifauna, including this kagu in the lower right-hand corner, which barks like a dog, and this really cool crow on the other side that uses tools and actually teaches its offspring how. Many of these species are threatened, particularly by mining activity. Because nickel ore is generally found in the surface layers of the soil, Mining it involves removing vegetation, which also leads to erosion and the sedimentation of rivers and streams, which causes flooding. And sediments also can suffocate surrounding coral reefs, which, as I'll discuss more today, were recently named a UNESCO World Heritage Area. Many of New Caledonia's natural resources, and in particular its marine resources, are also very important for its human populations, who rely on them for both subsistence and livelihood. The men mainly do the fishing, usually by going out on boats into the lagoon to look for fish, troca, and sea cucumbers, while the women gather shellfish along the beach and crabs in the mangroves. While that may seem like an easier activity, it's actually pretty intense. They wade out up to their knees in mud, and these are big, strong crabs that they're getting with nasty pinchers. And so when they find one, they have to kind of grab it, hold it against their chest, and quickly wrap its claws so it can't pinch them. But they are really tasty. Meanwhile, the governance of both marine and mineral resources takes place within a somewhat tense politico-economic context. New Caledonia is one of the last remaining French possessions in a post-colonial era, and since the 1970s, there has been an independence movement, including violent events in the 1980s, 
That's a photo of the uh, late independence leader Jean-Marie Chibaou, who was assassinated in 1988, and he's sitting in front of the Kanaki flag. But besides being important in its own right, New Caledonia is a valuable case study of conflicts over natural resource governance, involving several different types of resources that are valued for very different reasons by different stakeholder groups. Multinational mining companies have initiated two refinery construction projects in New Caledonia. One is known as the Northern Refinery, or the Coniambo Project, since it involves the Coniambo Massif, pictured in this photograph here. This project is operated by the Swiss multinational Extrata in collaboration with the local mining company, SMSP. I conducted the bulk of my fieldwork on this project in 2000 and 2001, but I've been continuing to collect some data on it ever since, but I've mainly focused on the other multinational refinery project in New Caledonia called the Southern Refinery which I began studying in 2006 in order to examine an indigenous protest group called Repunu. I'll move now to a, dis a discussion of the background to this project in order to contextualize my research and findings there. This southern project started off being known as Goro Nikul and being owned by the Canadian company Inco, which in 2006 was purchased by the Brazilian company CBRD, which then changed its name to Vale. So now the project is called Vale Nouvelle Caledonie, which kind of seems to sum up globalization in a nutshell, with references to Brazil, France, and even Scotland, all in a Melanesian setting. Vale is the world's largest iron ore and pellet producer, and the second largest producer of nickel, with a presence in 37 countries around the world. Valet completed the commercial refinery in 2008. When it's finally operational, the southern refinery is planning to process 4 million tons of ore per year for an annual output of 60,000 tons of nickel and 4,500 tons of cobalt. At the peak of the construction phase in 2008, the project employed about 6,000 people. By 2010, as it entered the production phase, this had dwindled to about 900. So the pilot refinery was completed in 1999, and in the early 2000s, local residents began to express increasing concerns about local ecosystems. A multitude of environmentalist grassroots organizations formed, mostly led by urban-based expatriates or Caledonians of European ancestry. Meanwhile, in 2002, the protest group known as Rebunu, which means Eye of the Country in the local language of Nume, was created specifically to focus on the Valley project. The group is led entirely by Kanak, but has support from environmental, non-governmental organizations and from citizens around the world. While not entirely opposed to the mining project, Rebunu has concerns about its potential environmental impacts, particularly on the marine resources upon which the local population depends. They are also concerned that Kanak will not benefit adequately from employment with the project, as evidenced by the companies bringing workers from the Philippines for the construction phase. Rebunu initiated a series of actions, including the distribution of pamphlets denouncing Inco's activities, the holding of public meetings at local villages, open letters sent to political leaders, legal action in the courts, and even blockades of the construction site, which turned into violent encounters with armed police. In April 20, 2006, a blockade resulted in the destruction of approximately $13 million worth of equipment and encounters with armed police in which four gendarmes were injured. Ultimately, 36 people were arrested and work was partially suspended at the site for over two weeks. Six weeks later, Rebunu, company representatives, non-indigenous environmentalist grassroots groups, and government officials sat down for a series of closed-door roundtable discussions organized by the southern province. The discussions continued under various forms and eventually evolved into two-way talks between Vale and Rebunu, brokered by each party's lawyer. Ultimately, in September 2008, 12 Rebunu leaders, 25 customary authorities, including chiefs, representatives of village and regional councils, and customary senators, and two Valley representatives, from all sides, only senior men, signed a pact for sustainable development of the far south of New Caledonia, 
referred to as the pact. Through this agreement, the mining company committed to funding local development initiatives, setting up an environmental customary consultative committee, again composed of senior men, training local environmental technicians, and implementing an extensive reforestation program. In exchange, Rebunu members committed to assert their point of view not through violent or illegal actions, but by dialogue. So first of all, to return to the first of the research questions I listed earlier, it's interesting to compare the two projects. They're both large-scale multinational mining projects, each involving the construction of a refinery. In fact, before they were bought out by even larger multinationals, both parent companies, Inco and Falconbridge, were headed, headquartered in the same town of scenic Sudbury, Ontario. The northern refinery is surrounded by a much larger human population, which is located much closer to it. Yet it was in the south that a grassroots protest movement arose to target the southern refinery. Why? Well, partly this was due to the fact that the southern refinery would utilize a new technology that has never been before been used in New Caledonia. Due to the low mineral content of the soils in the south, this refinery is hydrometallurgical, which means it use, uses acid under pressure to leach nickel and cobalt from the ore. The resulting effluent, containing additional dissolved minerals, will be discharged into the nearby lagoon through a pipeline. The idea of acid frightened people, and indeed there have been several massive accidental spills of sulfuric acid, one of which temporarily wiped out the local freshwater ecosystem. Part of the story also has to do with local micropolitics, which I won't get into today. However, nation-scale politics and economics were also important in informing people's engagements. The Northern Refinery Project, Konya Bonicle, was initiated in 1998 by the Société Minière du Sud Pacifique, or SNSP, a mining company of which Kanak owned the majority of shares, and which is controlled by the mainly pro-independence Northern Province. From its inception, this project has been viewed as important for rebalancing the economic inequities between the relatively impoverished North, where the population is almost entirely Kanak, and the wealthier South, where the capital and most of the people of European origins are based. The Konyambo project thus very early on became a political symbol of growing Kanak autonomy, with hopes that it would promote, as one interviewee put it, greater resource access for the Kanak. This political valence made it very difficult for people to oppose the project, even on environmental grounds. The southern refinery project, Valle Nouvelle Calédonie, in contrast, has never operated in partnership with a local Kanak run mining, mining company. It thus became a more obvious target for grassroots Kanak led opposition. Even in southern villages, where residents stood to benefit from employment opportunities, many expressed concern that the southern refinery would undermine the northern project's political economic goals of redistributing wealth to the primarily Kanak North. So this comparative research, which I've written a little a bit about, but I'm exploring further in my book manuscript, emphasizes the importance of political economic factors in conditioning grassroots resistance. But since 2006, I've mainly focused on the Valle Nouvelle Calédonie project, so I'll discuss that in a bit more depth now. And this brings us to the next question on the list. Once grassroots resistance to industrial development has arisen, what internal and external factors shape these processes and their outcomes? In New Caledonia, these factors were both political, economic, and socio-cultural, and sometimes both at once. Okay, so clearly there are many stakeholders involved here and several natural resources at stake. The relationships among all these groups form a rather dense network. And if I wanted to make this diagram even more complex and crowded, I could throw into the middle the natural resources themselves, such as minerals, biodiversity, marine resources, etc. And to make it even more complex, I could also add economic resources like salaries, profits, and political resources such as indigenous rights, the popular vote, international reputations, etc. So I decided to focus on one set of relationships and issues at a time. First, I'll talk about the community's relationships to scientists and scientific information. 
When people began opposing the Southern Refinery project, the company tried to convince the community that there was no cause for concern. Company representatives construed this opposition as stemming from fear based on ignorance, so their answer was to provide more technical information. So here's a page from the local newspaper advertising the company's community hotline and proclaiming Goro Nickel is listening to you. However, villagers disagreed about whether to trust the information that was being provided by company technicians, or by supposedly independent scientists, or by the scientists working with Red Renew. Meanwhile, many project employees joined the protest group in barricading the construction site and burning company equipment, and they were accused, even by the fellow villagers, of hypocrisy. But in investigating this problem, I found that the seeming irony of some project employees remaining loyal to their employer, while others burned company trucks, could be explained by examining the concept of affiliation. Here, I define affiliation as a sense of solidarity with a group and the desire to maintain that relationship. This affiliation, in turn, was informed by community members' expectations of long-term benefits and costs for themselves and for their people. Some villagers, many of whom were on a career path with the company, expected the project to create jobs for their children and to lead to long-term economic development for the country as a whole. Others felt that the company only had a short-term interest in New Caledonia and therefore would have no qualms about leaving behind polluted ecosystems. Instead, these residents viewed marine resources, which the project threatened, as their long-term economic security. Here's one of those crabs I mentioned before. Look at those pictures. Additionally, they valued a lifestyle in which they enjoyed abundant natural resources and the freedom to harvest them as the need arose. This lifestyle formed part of their identity as Kanak, in contrast to Westerners who, in their view, generally ate canned or frozen foods. Confident that they would succeed in shutting down the project before operations commenced, protest group members reasoned that in the interim, they might as well generate some earnings. For some, working for the mining project was actually a subversive act, a way of taking the company's money while enabling it to build the refinery and thus incur further expense in the certainty that the company would never see a return on its investment. These different expectations and preferences between the two groups of local res residents played a large role in determining which affiliations they chose to privilege which in turn influenced which scientific information they chose to trust. The next set of relationships I examined included the urban-based environmentalist grassroots organizations that allied themselves with Ray Renew. In understanding the strategic development of these relationships, I found it useful to look at to actor network theory, or ANT, particularly the concept of translation articulated by Michel Calon. In a drastic oversimplification, this translation framework proposes that not only are we trying to get what we want, we are trying to tell others what they want and to convince them that we are the only ones who can help them get it. I found this approach very useful in analyzing stakeholder relationships in the Valle de Belcaledini project because it helped to explain their motivations and interactions. Clearly, translation is inherently a power struggle. However, I felt that ANT did not adequately explore the ways that alliance and power intersect, so that's what I wanted to examine in the study. The Kanak as indigenous people had a source of power in the form of political and moral legitimacy that non-indigenous environmentalist groups uh, and grassroots leaders, whose logos are on the right-hand side over there, needed to tap into. So they needed to define the indigenous community as desiring the same goals as environmentalists, that of forcing the company to leave. They laid out roles for each party. The environmentalists would be the ultimate driving force behind the protests and the brains of the operation, providing the knowledge required to counter Valley's claims. In a complementary role, Ribunu would take action, violent if need be, to pressure the government and the company. However, the environmentalists were not the only ones translating Le Bonneau. A French human rights lawyer, who unfortunately doesn't have a logo, also claimed a role as their spokesman. In 2008, this lawyer drafted and helped negotiate the pact 
which was ultimately signed by both customary authorities and mining company representatives, but not by government representatives or the environmentalist grassroots groups. In allying himself with the indigenous group and severing their relationship to the government and the environmentalists, he had thus succeeded, temporarily, in making himself the sole intermediary between the Kanak and the company. Meanwhile, the indigenous protest group itself, uh, it's sort of in the center towards the bottom there, uh, their logo that is, performed its own translation of itself. Rather than aiming to preserve the local ecosystem at all costs, their main goals were to ensure that the project would cause the least environmental damage possible, and that the Kanak would benefit financially from it. In this translation, Rebunu was fighting for the rights of the Kanak people in the face of a threat to their livelihoods. They sought out alliances and support from the most powerful groups possible. While Rebunu leaders appreciated the support of the environmentalist grassroots groups, the international non-governmental organizations, the lawyers, and the citizens from around the world who championed their cause, the protest group leaders themselves would remain the spokespersons of the Kanak as a whole. Therefore, both mining company and the government would have to pass through Rebunu and them alone to reach their goal of putting the mining project into action. In the company's translation, that's that valley logo at the top, its representatives portrayed themselves as providing enormous economic benefits to the Kanak people. Thus, they tried to create privileged alliances between themselves and the majority of the Kanak population by coming between them and the protesters. Through the pact, however, they also managed to ally themselves with Rebunu itself, in the process cutting the group off from the government and the environmentalists. The provincial government, with that logo over the lower left-hand corner there, tried to claim a position as the institution that everybody else had to go through. It attempted to do this by facilitating negotiations between the protest group and the company, although the government itself was ultimately excluded from these negotiations. Meanwhile, the government translated the mining project as a significant source of revenue and sent in armed forces to defend the company from the protest group's attacks. Yet, it also positioned itself as sharing Rebunu's environmental concerns by commissioning first a government agency based in metropolitan France, and then a group of scientists based in France and Canada and approved by Rebunu to provide independent assessments. Thus, in a series of clumsily alternating dance steps, the southern province attempted to ally itself both with Valle and with Rebunu, each time by presenting itself as protecting one from the threat posed by the other. The very factors that forced the company and the government to take Rebunu into account also allowed them to ignore the environmentalists who were neither indigenous, violent, nor willing to negotiate. Not surprisingly, the indigenous group was consistently prioritized in negotiations with Valle and the government, and Rebunu's leaders were content to leave environmentalists in the role of sidekicks. The signing of the pact in September 2008 marked the beginning of a significant rift between Rebunu and the environmentalists. In summary, although each group had a unique translation of the situation, the environmentalist grassroots group's translation was fundamentally incompatible with the translations and specifically the goals of both the southern province and, more importantly, Valle. Rebunu's translation, in contrast, was compatible enough with the translations of these other institutions to allow them to become their privileged interlocutors. Power, in this instance, derived from the ability not only to manipulate other actors, but also from the strategic ability to ally themselves with others who were in a position to help them achieve their goals, or a mutually agreed upon version of these goals. Thus, the environmentalist power dissipated, as the indigenous group, for whom the relationship was far less crucial, refused to perform the role laid out for it, and as the environmentalist refused to engage, either through force or negotiation, with the company. The provincial government, seemingly unable to decide which party it desired to ally itself with more, ultimately alienated both who succeeded in ignoring it. Meanwhile, Rebunu and Vale were able to align their translations of each other just enough to allow them to achieve an agreement that eliminated, at least temporarily, the threat of violent protest in return for the promise of benefits for the Kanak. So in summary, to return to that question of what shapes processes of resistance, I found that alliances can be very powerful in building that resistance, and yet these alliances are almost inevitably based in unequal power relations, and therefore they can backfire for some parties in really significant ways.
in seeking to ally themselves with Webunu, the non-indigenous grassroots protesters had been seeking indigenous legitimacy by association. Indeed, legitimacy played a really important role in shaping the processes and outcomes of this resistance, and it came in many different forms. For instance, one major factor was that people questioned the legitimacy not only of the current government, but of the entire democratic system of governance. Instead, they were privileging customary forms of authority, as symbolized by this high chief's hut. Sociocultural factors played a large role in these conceptualizations of legitimacy. In Kanak custom, the authority to speak about land matters comes from membership of a first occupant clan. The descendants of the first clans to occupy an area possess the highest social status, with other clans hierarchically ranked in order of arrival. They possess the sole customary authority to decide how the land will be used. In theory, membership of these clans is quite straightforward. In practice, however, there are almost always differing versions of this genealogical history. Indeed, around the project area, the identity and membership of first occupant clans was highly controversial. Both mining project and protest group strove to associate these forms of legitimacy with their own endeavors by forging relationships with customary authorities, but they approached this thorny question in different ways. In the 1990s, before beginning work on the pilot refinery, Inca representatives performed a customary ceremony with local chiefs and customary landowners in an official show of respect. However, they relied heavily on a few individual ties. Over the years, they built an especially close relationship with the chief of Goro, spurring resentment from others who contested his clan's authority over local lands. When the chiefs of Goro and Unya both died in 2004, the mining company was left without a close ally among local residents. Meanwhile, Rebunu leaders were not members of first occupant clans. However, from its inception, Rebunu took care to portray itself as representing Kanak customary authorities. At first, it succeeded in doing so, and thus attracted support from the local community, as well as from international non-governmental organizations, NGOs, and the local grassroots groups I discussed earlier. On a theoretical level, this addressed the question of what factors play crucial roles in conditioning resource-related violent conflict. The literature on environmental security and the resource curse portray resource-related conflict as being driven by resource scarcity or abundance, respectively. In contrast, my findings indicated that environmental violence is more complex and can mask other crises, such as, in this instance, a crisis of political legitimacy. This crisis, in turn, was grounded in a history of opposition to the colonial power. So this takes us up to the events of 2006, but now I'm working on a couple of papers that build on this recent history and examine what happened next. Indeed, around 2006, customary authorities began to feel that Rebo knew no longer represented them. They resented being used for their customary legitimacy and disapproved of the group's increasingly violent tactics. Around the same time, negotiations between Vale and Rebunu were hitting an impasse. In early 2008, the company began laying the pipeline that would dump effluent in the, into the marine environment, sparking fresh protests and blockades. In the midst of this turmoil, Rebunu was swept into office at the municipal level, reinforcing many customary authorities' perception of the group as political, not customary, and therefore not authorized to speak on behalf of the chiefs. However, the group vehemently denied that it had become a political party, and continued to base its identity in customary legitimacy. A 2008 brochure proclaimed, Rebunu is the word, that, that is to say the mouthpiece, of the chieftainships, the clans, and the indigenous Kanak of the South. At this point, Vale flew a legal specialist from Brazil as the new lead negotiator. He took a different tactical approach, the distinguishing feature of which, and the basis of its legitimacy, was that it was more inclusive. Instead of the failed strategies of countering protesters with force or addressing their demands directly, Vale could counterbalance and undermine their influence 
by capturing the deeply held cultural ideal of customary legitimacy. To do this, it needed to broaden its engagement strategy, including not the entire community, as many women and young people sympathize with the protest group, but the sector most sympathetic to the project, customary authorities. The negotiator portrayed this strategy as culturally sensitive. The tripartite negotiations that ensued effectively marginalized Rebunu. If the group was, as it claimed, representing customary authorities, the presence of the latter at the table rendered the protesters redundant and silenced them. As customary authorities' support for the mining project became highlighted through their engagement in the negotiation process, Valet captured customary legitimacy, wresting it away from Rebunu. Ultimately, in September 2008, representatives of all three parties signed the pact. Rebunu was able to do this without too great a loss of dignity by pointing to the project's takeover by the Brazilians, whom they described as culturally closer to themselves than the Canadians, the company's previous owners. Go figure. Vale, of course, nourished this comparison with its own rhetoric. In capturing customary legitimacy at the local scale, Valle also captured the ideal of indigenous legitimacy from the international perspective. Ironically, to maintain his group's indigenous legitimacy in the eyes of the international community, Webunu's main leader found himself needing to team up with the multinational. At a United Nations workshop, this leader joined Webunu's lawyer and Valle's negotiator in presenting a case study from New Caledonia lauded by the UN as an exemplary process that had led to a mutually acceptable result. Two years later, the UN Special Rapporteur on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples also praised the pact. Bali itself, of course, was quick to point to this in agreement as an example of a best practice and benchmark in the relationship between resource companies and Aboriginal communities." End quote. Even a Rebunu leader lauded the pact as demonstrating that the company had achieved the community's prior and informed consent, which is a clear misattribution of the term since the agreement was signed nine years after the completion of the pilot refinery and without the knowledge of most community members, and the community was never given a choice as to whether or not the project should proceed. So corporate social responsibility is a program a voluntary self-regulation that seeks to preempt environmental and social problems associated with corporate activities. So this paper that I'm, I'm currently working on understands CSR initiatives such as the pact as a form of neoliberalism. In other words, it's working to secure a socio-political economic context that allows capitalist development to proceed. It builds upon literature that analyzes neoliberalism as articulating with particular political economic conditions and argues that such articulation is also necessarily cultural. Local cultural contexts determine crucial factors such as here how to capture and co-opt grassroots social movements. In summary, the mining company undercut and ultimately co-opted local resistance, largely by successfully capturing the ideologies of customary and indigenous legitimacy. Back in the villages, women and young people expressed their deep disappointment, which sometimes took the form of rage. This time, not against the company, but against Rebunu leaders. However, feeling that the pact had negated their ability to protest, they too gave up the struggle. This leads into the next paper that I'm working on, which analyzes the relationships between corporate social responsibility and violence. CSR especially seeks to preempt any violent conflict associated with resistance to their activities and the repression of this resistance, which is bad for corporate reputations. Within the CSR toolkit is the Impact and Benefit Agreement, or IBA, a company community contract which formally documents community acceptance of a project in exchange for various types of benefits. Clearly, corporations' willingness to negotiate with communities 
reduces the physical violence committed both in opposition to and in support of industrial activities. However, this begs the question of whether IBAs simply eliminate violence or whether they may actually perpetrate other forms of violence. The pact, a type of IBA, effectively ended a protest movement that, as you'll recall, had included the burning of company equipment and confrontations with armed police. However, I argue that while this agreement eliminated the physical violence associated with the mining project, it actually furthered both ecological and social harm, particularly towards women, through what I call contractual violence. I examine this question through the framework of theories about different types of violence and through the lens of feminist theories insights about the meaning of consent. Violence may be defined as an action or a condition that reduces the functional capacity of its victims. These victims may be either humans, in which case it could be labeled social violence, or non-humans, such as ecosystems, in which case it could be called ecological or environmental violence. If committed by a corporation, it becomes corporate environmental violence. Types of violence may also be grouped by their mode of operation. Personal or direct violence is committed by an individual, while structural or indirect violence involves systemic harms such as unequal power and the uneven distribution of resources. Another form of indirect violence is cultural violence. Belief systems that can be used to justify or legitimize direct or structural violence, making harmful acts or conditions socially acceptable. Feminist theorists have also highlighted the problematic nature of any contract that renders violence acceptable on the ground that it is based in consent. Indeed, the consent that the contract putatively embodies often masks coercion by concealing the negotiation process, its social context, and the resultant bargain. As Catherine McKinnon notes, quote, when fear and despair produce acquiescence, and acquiescence is taken to mean consent, consent is not a meaningful concept. Even more problematic is consent granted by putative representatives on behalf of a wider group. When I asked company representatives why no women had been invited to negotiate or sign the pact, their reply, offered with a scoffing chuckle, was that this was normal in light of Canuck cultural values. The customary authorities who had signed the pact also thought it perfectly normal that only senior men had been chosen as representatives of their people. Nonetheless, several noted that they would not have objected had Valley had separate, no, held separate negotiations with local women to address their particular concerns. Even had the customary authorities objected to negotiating with women, a reference to custom is of questionable morality. Similar arguments have been used in meeting out very lenient sentences to indigenous men in rape cases. Arguably, then, it is inappropriate to accept violence against women, whether personal or structural, on the grounds that this violence is customary. Moreover, there was a logical inconsistency in Valet's argument about the importance of respecting the customary authorities' wishes. A former Valet employee recalled that the customary authorities had reproached us for grant, quote, reproached us for granting too much importance to Rebunu. However, Rebunu leaders have been given an equal place at the negotiating table over the customary authorities' objections, and Vale had insisted that they sign the pact over their own objections that this should be left to the customary authorities. Clearly, the fact that women lacked any recognized customary political authority and did not engage in physically violent resistance, independently of Rebunu, meant that they could safely be ignored. Another possible explanation may lie in women's differential interests and concerns. First, a major stake in the mining project was the social recognition of positions of customary authority that the company offered. This recognition may have influenced customary authority support for the project, but would not apply to women who are unable to occupy a position of customary authority. Secondly, women were far less interested in the employment opportunities offered by the project. Instead, village women expressed concern that local marine resources their means of subsistence and livelihood, were threatened by the project. Therefore, excluding women may have been a strategic move to enable the company to avoid, to the maximum extent, having to reduce its inevitable ecological violence 
through technical alterations. Beyond marginalizing women's concerns, the pact also allowed ballet to take greater control over its environmental performance in two ways. First, the pact directed regulatory power away from the government. Concomitantly, it channeled community members' environmental concerns, observations, and objections into a form that did not threat, threaten company activities. On several occasions, the Administrative Tribunal of Numea, which that is not a picture of, by the way, had repealed the project's permits, requiring extensive and costly further studies. Additionally, in 2006, Ribbonu succeeded in convincing the Paris Tribunal, which that is a picture of, to order a partial halt of the refinery's construction, although the appeals court overturned its decision a few months later. Not surprisingly, the Valley wanted to avoid having to go to court, which is a situation in which companies are vulnerable, as they face institutions with real power to cost them significant amounts of time and money, and ultimately to stop their operations altogether. Therefore, the pact specified that any future disagreements should be resolved through discussion or failing an amicable agreement through a group of third-party arbitrators selected by each party rather than through the courts. The pact also aimed to channel community members' concerns about project activities away from direct action, such as burning trucks, and into forms that Valley itself could control. For instance, the Environmental Customary Consultative Committee that the PAC set up could only provide opinions directly to Valet, with no capacity to pass these on to the regulatory authority. In return, Valet committed to, quote, put into place corrective mechanisms so as to maintain conformity with the environmental standards applicable to this project, which it had to do anyway, in light of the relevance, determined, of course, by Valet, of the committee's recommendations. Meanwhile, the environmental technicians, who were recruited, minimally trained, and then paid by Valet, could only recommend further environmental studies, not actual practices. Indeed, there was no provision for pressuring Valet in any meaningful way to change its environmental management procedures. Meanwhile, there was in fact a lesser chance than before the pact signature that the company would alter these procedures, given that there was now a lesser risk of public exposure. Confident that they had managed to channel the expression of community concerns away from the courts, the international non-governmental organizations, and the media, Valley began reducing their on-site community relations personnel. So returning to my original research questions about what shapes environmental struggles and their outcomes, this points to what goes on behind the scenes of interactions among the various actors. It shows how power can superficially appear to be distributed while it is actually being consolidated, both by intensifying power inequalities within internally diverse communities and by transferring power toward rather than away from the company. Full information about these processes does not always reach the international community, which judges the moral, moral legitimacy of both companies and protesters. However, I argue that international bodies must take a careful look at the representativity of each of the groups in question. A project with both legal and customary legitimacy may still not represent the community's interests and thus may not deserve the attribution of moral legitimacy in the international eye. In another paper that's based on fieldwork conducted over the summer of 2012, I'm further examining the role of the international community in shaping the processes and outcomes of grassroots engagements with industrial development, this time, ironically, through international conservation efforts. First, a brief word about conservation. By setting aside natural areas and thus removing lands and resources from local people, who are often poor and therefore vulnerable, conservation initiatives have resulted in social impacts and human rights abuses, as many studies have shown. In response to this, in the 1980s, conservationists began to implement co-management strategies in which governments or NGOs attempt to work with local residents. When they didn't see easy immediate results, however, many reverted to a fences and fines, fortress conservation approach, 
Rarely, however, do multinational conservation NGOs target the agents of industrial development. The reasons are clear. Corporations have money, lots of it, and they are happy to give some of it to conservation NGOs in order to improve their environmental image, a process known as greenwashing. The ironic result is that big international non-governmental organizations, or bingos, find themselves allied with logging, oil, and mining companies that threaten the very ecosystems that the conservationists claim to protect. So I wanted to examine what happens when grassroots resistance to industrial development meets bingo-led conservation through protected areas, through a case study of the inscription of sections of New Caledonia's coral reef system on UNESCO's World Heritage List. The two approaches would, on the surface, appear to share the aim of preventing environmental damage. However, I argue that despite, or perhaps because of, efforts to ensure local people's participation in the management of these areas, this inscription process deeply undermined resistance to such damage. UNESCO was founded, along with the rest of the UN, in the aftermath of World War II in an effort to promote peace. Roughly three decades later, in 1972, UNESCO adopted the Convention Concerning the Protection of the World's Cultural and Natural Heritage, which outlines the process for requesting sites inscription on the World Heritage List and the preservation of these sites that's necessary for them to remain on this list. As of 2013, this list contains 745 cultural sites, 188 natural, and 29 mixed properties. The World Heritage Committee, composed of state party representatives, relies on advice from international non-governmental or intergovernmental organizations. For natural sites, the advisory NGO is IUCN, the International Union for the Conservation of Nature. IUCN has come under criticism for partnering with corporations, including a five-year collaboration with Shell that it launched in 2007, coincidentally also the year it was evaluating New Caledonia's World Heritage bid. The project of obtaining World Heritage inscription was first conceived by local urban-based environmentalists as a means of protecting New Caledonia's reefs from the multinational mining projects that were threatening it. They submitted a dossier to UNESCO in 2001, asking for inscription of the entire reef system. However, this was rejected. At that time, the idea of requesting World Heritage listing for the reefs was opposed by many local politicians who feared that it would inhibit economic development. They attempted, with a fair degree of success, to turn Kanak villagers against it as well, convincing them that they would lose their fishing rights. In 2004, however, a new political party came into power that was somewhat less politically and socially conservative than their predecessors. They took up the dossier, commissioned extensive studies, and resubmitted it to UNESCO in 2007. The following year, it was accepted, and New Caledonia's reefs were added to the World Heritage List. Or rather, parts of the reef system were. New Caledonian politicians had chosen to submit a serial nomination consisting of six marine clusters. They insisted that the other areas were already degraded and therefore would not have been eligible. Environmentalists suspected that these zones had, in, in essence, cut around the mining projects so as not to interfere with their activities and that the inscription project had only become acceptable once government officials were reassured that the mining sector would not be harmed. Interestingly, however, New Caledonia's most environmentally controversial multinational mining project, Valle Nouvelle Calédonie, ended up right on the edge of marine cluster number one. I'm going to zoom in there now. Okay, so here that is, that zone number one. Keep your eye on the section up in the top of the map, and let me overlay it with the map from Valle of its operations. And there you'll see that line, that white line against the blue going into the lagoon. That's the effluent diffuser or pipeline, which is spilling into the area's buffer zone, that green area there, dark, dark green. 
So while they were aware of the potential risks to the inscribed area from the mining project, UNESCO and IUCN representatives expressed certainty based on the information the company provided them that it had taken precautions to avoid negative impacts. Instead of addressing the mining project then, World Heritage efforts focused on local fishing practices. Despite the fact that biological surveys, including those performed by IUCN itself, had shown fishing not to be particularly impacting local ecosystems. In its recommendations to UNESCO, IUCN insisted upon the creation of management committees, comprised of representatives of local communities selected by the communities themselves. In response, the New Caledonian government facilitated the creation of such committees. The government body in charge of facilitating these management committee meetings was the Department of Environment and Natural Resources, which has no control over mining. Valet was often present at these meetings to respond to people's concerns by providing information, but there was no direct regulatory pressure on them to change any practices. Local Canuck community members evidenced a range of responses to the World Heritage Listing. For some, this made the reef seem all the more precious and strengthened their desire to see it preserved from pollution or other destructive processes. For others, the UNESCO inscription relieved some anxiety about the reef's protection. The agency's statement about the high quality of the ecosystem and their regulatory, regular monitoring reassured them that the reef was in good condition and was being watched over. For some of these local residents, UNESCO became, in essence, an alternative to Rebunu. Rather than fighting the mining project by barricading operations and burning equipment, a great risk to themselves, they would support the World Heritage Project by joining the management committees or even helping marine biologists to collect data. Rebunu leaders, for their part, expressed reassurance that UNESCO's willingness to inscribe the reef on its World Heritage list signify that the mining activities could not be posing a serious threat to the marine environment. There were, of course, other reasons why the protest group ceased its aggressive activities and signed the pact, as I've just discussed. However, it is clear that the World Heritage Listing was a contributing factor, or at least provided an excuse. As a rainbow new leader articulated, if it hadn't been for UNESCO, we would have opposed the mining project. We would have continued the struggle. The protest group thus shifted responsibility for protecting the reef to UNESCO, who shifted it to IUCN as the NGO advisor. IUCN, in turn, shifted this responsibility onto the government of the state party, i.e. France, explaining that IUCN could only recommend to UNESCO that the agency add or subtract sites from the list without either organization being able to play a real role in the site's management. Given that, at the moment of inscription, the mining project had not yet begun dumping its effluents into the lagoon, IUCN declared the area in, to be in good enough condition to merit inscription at that time. In summary, international conservation efforts can shape grassroots engagement, ironically, by serving to support industrial development, specifically here by undermining, undermining resistance to it. Thus, resistance does not only get countered by, through a violent repression by state power, it can be surreptitiously, even inadvertently, destabilized by a collusion of the interests of industrial development and those of the conservation organizations and governments that depend directly or indirectly upon it. Ultimately, in this scenario, conservation actually enables an extension of industry's power. Now, as promised in my talk title, I'm going to transport you away from the South Pacific to sunny New Jersey. There, I looked at a rather different community's engagements with a different type of industry. Trucking. And I'm glad to say I did not take that photograph. Its location between New York City and Philadelphia makes New Jersey a locus of frequent travel, crisscrossed by trucking routes. However, the state also encompasses 903,000 acres of wetlands protected by federal and state regulations, although many are badly degraded. The continual expansion of development and industrialization in New Jersey 
exists in tension with anxieties about the health, safety, and well-being of its human residents, and with desires to save the state's remaining wetlands. The Dismal Swamp is one of those wetlands. In urban wetlands, it stretches across three municipalities, Edison, Metuchen, and South Plainfield. In 1994, the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, EPA, designated 200 acres at the heart of the swamp as priority wetlands, noting that the area is threatened by severe residential industrial development. This designation requires any proposed development to undergo a more rigorous permitting process administered by the New Jersey Department of Environmental Protection, or NJDEP. South Plainfield has hosted factories since its origins a century ago. In the 1960s, Interstate 20, 287, which you see cutting through the sort of left-hand corner of that, that map there, that interstate was carved through the south of the borough, while the industrial zone remains in the eastern section, sort of the northeast corner of that, uh, actually just a bit outside of the um, map there. Residential Hamilton Boulevard, which you can sort of see cutting down uh, through the town in the upper left-hand corner, experienced increasing levels of traffic, largely composed of trucks transiting between the industrial zone and I-287. South Plainfield has, uh, oh, sorry, <clears throat> excuse me. In January 2008, South Plainfield created an ad hoc, hoc truck route committee to pursue the Hollywood Ab Avenue truck bypass, which would cross priority wetlands. In 2009 and 2010, committee members met several times with NGA DEP officials to assess whether an application was likely to be approved, but in March 2010, they received a letter discouraging them from applying. As an NJDEP official confided to me, the road project was being sidelined largely because it did not have a strong advocate such as a powerful political figure. Ultimately then, power determines outcomes, as might be expected. However, the debates around the processes of grassroots engagement were themselves informative. I found that what shaped those debates and the moral microboundaries they engendered were fundamentally different conceptions of who or what was vulnerable and who or what was threatening those vulnerable entities. Road proponents worried about local residents and school children, whom they saw as vulnerable to the risk of accidents and pollution from the trucks. Meanwhile, they insisted that the swamp, which they viewed as teeming with disease and harboring vagrants and delinquents, would not be harmed by a carefully designed road through a small corner of it. Environmentalists, in contrast, worried about the wetlands and its wildlife, which they saw as vulnerable to encroaching development, and they argued that local residents were threatened by toxic waste rather than by trucks. These different understandings of what was threatened, and therefore in need of protection, and what was causing this risk, led logically to incompatible solutions. Each side's argument was thus grounded not just in selfish irrationality, but in clear, if distinct and mutually incom incompatible, reasoning processes. These processes, in turn, were each based in both ontological claims and emotional commitments, themselves inextricably intertwined and woven into values that logically prescribed action plans. Clearly, open debate through a Habermasian communicative rationality could never resolve such differences. Instead, I argue that acceptance of the existence and irreconcilability of distinct perspectives forces us to renounce hope of a potentially agreed upon common good. Ironically, such a step is necessary if we are ever to achieve the agonistic pluralism that Chantal Mouffe has called for and that I agree is central to a healthy democracy. Ultimately, I argue that for democratic pluralism to be agonistic rather than antagonistic, this agonism must be empathic, involving recognition of the rationality of, of opponents' emotional commitments while continually engaging in respectful debates over possible solutions. 
Well, I think I've taken up enough of your time, so I'll just briefly mention that I'm just starting a new research project in the Bad River watershed in northern Wisconsin, looking at grassroots engagements with a mining project near an Ojibwe reservation. Although this project has its own unique political, economic, and socio-cultural context, I see the potential for some interesting comparisons with New Caledonia and possibly even New Jersey. I want to examine how these different conditions shape a different struggle and how these processes might result in different outcomes. Thank you.